say hit the record button so everybody you can click that prompt and then um all right let me to kick off our discussion this week this i want on solo aging i want to share a couple of slides and then we'll bring joy to the stage so first off you know before i started doing these online discussions i never heard the term solo ager and it was people were um they were using it to describe themselves so they would be in chat saying i'm a solo ager this and that and that's how carol and i connected because i was sort of like i went on google and i typed in solo aging and carol your name popped up so i was like well uh here's an authority on solo aging i want to link up with carol and uh and host some of these discussions and uh but the term that i had heard was elder orphan and that was always such a depressing term and and whenever i mentioned it to people they would just be like oh that is that is a horrible term it's just so sad you know and so i think you know prior to some of these great discussions we've been doing my vision of solo aging and elder orphan might be sort of like the picture that you see on the screen there now but after hosting several discussions um with you carol and talking about this in detail what i realize is is that solo aging is a badge that people wear proudly like the way that you just described yourself as a solo ager and the other side of the coin is is that when you see a lovely couple here you might say well they're not solo agers they've got each other and maybe they have two or three kids or what have you so they'll never have to worry about solo aging and one of the things that we've discovered in these discussions is that we all have to worry about solo aging that that we need a plan on what our life would be like if we outlive our spouse if our kids move away and aren't there in a supportive role and um that's one of the themes that has really come out of these discussions that i think is really exciting this is a topic that everybody needs to um at least give some thought to so um that's sort of my warm-up there let me um now welcome to the stage someone who really needs no introduction because joy you are um you have been viewed as a, a leader and an expert in uh the senior living field for many years um you're the author joy is the author of the complete elder care planner but her most recent book is who will take care of me when i'm old which is a very fitting title for a discussion on solo aging um so carol and i are gonna um monitor questions because i know you love interactive discussions and um the um um uh we'll we'll try to to feed you questions as they come in but before we dive into our discussion tell everybody a little bit about yourself um well i've been doing this since 1985 the first edition of my book came out and i headed for corporate america so for the first 30 years of my career i was in employee benefits programs going all over the country talking to employees and then for the most part i was um, hired by senior living uh, sponsors and then did my past 20 years running around and uh, helping uh, people understand the value of living in the community lifestyle. But about 10 years ago, something very interesting happened. When I was doing talks about caregiving, what would happen is that people would come up to me and they'd say, well, you know, I'm doing this for my parents. I'm taking care of my parents. But who's going to take care of me when I'm old? And boom, I knew right away that would be my next book. So now we have come full circle. We are not only taking care of loved ones, including spouses and siblings, but many of us are simultaneously taking care of parents and siblings and children. So all the caregivers got older and 
That's been the story of my entire career. I've stayed focused on family caregiving and aging with other people in mind. So two books, full circle, here we are. I love it. And, All right. And I have what? to say, well, I just want to say I've known Joy for, yeah. gosh, you know, Joy, you haven't known me that much, that long. Well, anyway, I met you via online when I was a family caregiver and found your book. Because I was struggling, my sisters and I were struggling with mm -hmm. all the things we had to do. So thank you for that <laughs> wonderful book. You're welcome. It's been, a, it's been so fun. And um, it's constantly evolving. And here we are together, Carol. I know. I know. It's yeah. great. This is, this is great. And, and so uh, we all brainstormed before this discussion, because as those of you who have tuned into these these discussions, we like to feature authors because they're they're really thought leaders and they've they've articulated higher concepts and ideas and what have you. And so when we were talking with Joy, we were talking about how could we approach this? And I, I think we came up with a brilliant idea. So like everything I do, it's an experiment and we're going to see if it works. But what what we did was um i i went through the table of contents on joy's book and um it's organized beautifully and she breaks the book down into these five parts okay and so what i've done is i've done a slide for each of those five parts and so what we thought would be a great idea is for us to just kind of walk through the book and have joy just sort of pull out some important topics and ideas and then we want to riff with you the audience on these topics and ideas and if you're the way the audience usually is we might not make it to part five okay <laughs> um but 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 let's give this the old college try and um and carol you keep your eyes and ears on q a and chat as i will and if you see something in there that that strikes your fancy just jump in and 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 we'll 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 get this discussion started but joy before we dive into part one maybe just share with us just the how you organize the book into these five parts well first of all we could talk about aging till we're blue in the face but unless we're ready for it we have to we have to come to terms with what that means. What in the world are we really planning for? So personal readiness says, am I really ready to take this on? And then and then the rest is just uh, in in personal readiness is also the money the money card. So we have to think about uh, personal readiness as well as financial readiness for a. Okay, for here let's just person. jump. I'm just going right, to go. <laughs> let, let's just jump in. Okay. okay so you've got personal readiness and yeah. folks just in the audience, which you can see is all the different chapters in that part. But, but Joy, give us some things to think about and then folks just jump in with your questions yeah. and comments. Okay. So um, I, what I did was when Steve said, what should we talk about for each chapter? I took out the one that I thought would be the most interesting and the one that we hardly ever hear when people engage in this conversation. So I want to have a conversation about critical thinking. Now, why do I think that critical thinking is really important? Because there's way too much emphasis on resilience. Now, resilience is great. You know, there's a lot of uh, workshops on how to become a resilient person. However, resilience is reactive. It's what to do when something bad happens. But what if we could think like a strategist, which is on page 27 on the, on the slide there, what if we could actually avoid a whole slew of problems through critical thinking? Now, a lot of, well, like you, you may not know what critical thinking is. I didn't know, but I thought it was important to put in the book. So critical thinking is something we all need to learn. And that was why I wanted to bring that up in this first chapter. The readiness for, let's just avoid the, the reactive resilience and dive right into, let's be proactive and learn about critical thinking. You know, I think, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I think that's fabulous, Joy, because 
Well, uh, what I found myself doing after helping mom and dad is I realized I'm going to be aging alone. And I thought, you know, I'm going to have to really start thinking about these things critically uh, and to start assessing where I am in each life domain. So I totally agree with that. That's wonderful. Oh, good. Yeah. And, and Joe, Joe, uh, Joe Sperling says that he goes, do so what do the do this planning while you can before the need for care happens and feel great about it i mean it's i think the, the it, what's interesting is probably everybody in the audience i know we've got such a smart uh, established audience that everybody has risen to their professions or they're they're skilled in something and they they they've applied critical thinking to that but then when it comes to this it's oftentimes they're lost or they just want to ignore it because in in the hopes that it's never going to happen but um and oh risa mandel says please ask please define critical thinking as you understand it and thanks in advance okay i love this this is something i didn't know i did a lot of research Critical thinking is the ability to ask different people, anybody who is not the same as you, people young, people old, people in different cultures, people in different professions. So come up with a question that is um, important to you, like, where should I live? And then go around and ask people, what would you do if you were in my situation? How would you go about doing this? And you will get so many different kinds of points of views on how to, let's say, figure out where we want to live in old age, right? I even have my nine-year-old granddaughter on my list of questions to ask. And she comes up with the most brilliant things. So critical thinking is the ability to get out of your comfort zone and go and ask questions, write them all down and begin to look for different patterns and different things that are doable. Um, the more we get input from people who are unlike ourselves, different cultures, people who are rich, people who are not rich, all these different kinds of people and begin to do your research on what's possible. The, best critical thinking I've ever done is talking to people 30 years older than me and asking them, what do you wish you had done differently? Or what, what did you do right? What do you wish you didn't do? This is critical thinking and there's lots of books on it, but I wanted to apply it to my own personal aging process. And so far it's proven to be just the thing I needed. I, I wasn't interested in wanting to be resilient as much as I wanted to know how could I avoid getting myself in a tough situation. That's fabulous. Uh, Su that is, I, I think that's one of the best definitions I've heard. And Susan Evans just chimed in and she said, your audience is a critical thinking group. Isn't that yeah. why we're here? And yes. you are dead on, Susan. And yep. and here's here's the thing that I always say we're kind of preaching to the choir in this audience, just attending an event like this is defines critical thinking in the way that Joy just laid it out. What we need to do is, is encourage our friends, families, clients, and loved ones to join us. And that's one of the best things that I love about this being recorded is, is that you can basically say, hey, I just participated in a discussion on solo aging. I think you should take a peek at it and hopefully we can get more people joining our tribe. So uh, really good. Well, absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that Melissa uh, Bressler, who's with Handy Pro, she says, I mean, this is really right on. It kind of sums up what Joy is saying is that planning ahead is the key to unlocking the door on aging well. And I have to agree. And I'm sure Joy would too. Yeah, great comment. comment uh, uh, um, Melissa and, um, let's see, Joe Sperling says making decisions in a panic 
is usually not good or usually not good ones. Stress well, and pressure is not conducive to the best decisions. So, so Joe, what I say is there is no planning in a crisis. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> there and isn't any. What, yeah, and as a caregiver, I can vouch that happens all the time. <laughs> you get what you get. That's right. That's not a plan. No. <laughs> yep. So, so uh, Joy, I'm gonna I'm gonna advance the slide to part yep. two, so we can try to get through the whole book. Um, and, um, but before, before I do that, I want to share like our last solo aging discussion, which I'm going to put the post, the link to, it was the theme dove into making friends and creating a circle, um, around you. And Rita, Rita says, how can I network and meet other people my own age and other ages so I might create my own circle who can help me or help us as resources? I, I'm not sure if that's in this part, hey, but I Steve, wanted to throw that one out right now. Absolutely. Go to part three. We'll go back to part two. Part okay, two is great. okay. Part Let, three. Let's do that. Okay. okay. Here we go. So I hear this question all the time. How can I make friends? How can I create some kind of support? I love that question. However, that is that there is a better question to ask. First of all, there is no shortage of places to meet people. Men and women and women and men, we don't have to just define our friends to the same sex. We can have you know interchangeable uh, friends because I have a lot of male friends who who would be there for me at two in the morning and vice versa. So it is it is, um, you know, mixed up there. But the the question nobody seems to ask themselves is what kind of friend am I? We can't just be a bunch of solo agers looking out to the horizon and saying to ourselves, who can I make friends with? We've got to it. Carol, you said it best when we had the when we had the uh, workshop last time. It takes time, and what happens is is we test our friendships. We go first. If we say to someone, "I'll be there for you," and then we're not, then what kind of friend are we? In the process of being a friend, you will start to cement your friendships by being there for each other over and beyond what you think you need to do. There are people everywhere. My book and Carol's book and every book, uh, Sarah's book, Sarah Gefford's book, we all talk about where to meet people. That's not the problem. The problem is, is what kind of friend am I? How come, so, so I hear people say to me, how come all my friends disappear as soon as I get sick? Well, what kind of friend are you? Are you constantly uh, leaning on these people? Is it, is it your expectation that you, they would be there to take care of you? I heard the most incredible um, interview two days ago. It was about friends going to therapy. I think that's a really good idea. If we have friends and we don't know how to cement that glue and we're afraid of losing our friends, we should go to therapy just like we might if we were with an, another important relationship. We cannot treat our friends any differently than family members. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I agree. Great thoughts. And, and I'll make sure to drop in the link uh, into chat to the previous discussion we did because we yeah. pretty much talked about ideas and things like this for an hour, but, but Joy, your suggestion was not something that came up in that discussion. So I, I love it. It was, it's, it's really, and, and you know, what, what, it, what's that all about? It's about critical thinking on who am I as a friend. It's being willing, as you had just said, to think outside the box. Let's. Uh, hey, Steve, I have a question for you from the audience. Sure. Uh, it's from, it looks like Rita. She's asking, is this group doing anything in person? Oh, I hope so. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Rita, the the, the uh, <laughs> this, this these discussions were born out of live events that we used to do. And here's the best thing: 
Our live events were only attended by senior serving professionals, people that worked in the workplace. And when we first started doing these um, online, they were all senior serving professionals. As you know, when you register, you tell us a little bit about your profile. Th these discussions are a balanced mix of older adults, their family members, and senior serving professionals, and it's so exciting. I can't wait to get back to live events. More than likely, what we're going to do in the future is we're going to do live events that have an online component because our um, the, the first question that we got today says, I live in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle. Your organization's resources seem to be primarily in the Northeast. Is there a sister organization that supports Pacific Northwest? And uh, what's happened since we've gone online is we've got, we are, most of us are in the Mid-Atlantic on this call, but I'll tell you, there's people from all over the world that tune into these discussions. So, uh, so that's a good one. Um, Joy, so how about we move- do you mind if I ask Joy a question? This is oh, from please. one of the audience, it's from Lisa Cook. And she's asking, she says, I'm a great friend to have. I give friends rides to and from the airport to the hospital. While it's easy to go to meetups and meet people, I think it's very hard to find people who want to commit to having others backs, you know, take care of each other. Mm -hmm. And she says, I've been uh, building community for 11 years. And she just, she wanted to know, how would you go about, you know, creating more consistency within, you know, your your group, your own personal groups? So we we don't always like our friends equally, and we don't always trust them equally. We know some people who are consistently late, some people who just make us laugh. We know people who um, wouldn't we couldn't call at two in the morning. And what I would start to do is instead of being a people collector and being overly nice is to begin to narrow it down to people, but, a, but a, a, a good group, like five people, not just one or two, because we need a bigger network. But I would begin the process, instead of always being the person who is doing the giving, start asking, because we have to test our relationships and see if somebody will be there for us. You cannot be the giver and expect that people will be there for us. It just doesn't work like that. Um, unfortunately, we can be really, really nice and people will start taking advantage of that. So I say, <clears throat> please start to do the asking and see what happens. And if that, if that proves to be that those people are not there for you, I would begin the process of widening my net for people. I tend to, uh, my, me personally, I am a member of a, of a group called the Transition Network, which is here in Chicago, but they are a national women's group for women over 50. And I have made some friends who would be there for me 24-7 uh, and vice versa. But it took, it took time. Great, great thoughts, Joy. Let's go back to part two, because we jumped to, sure. to part uh, three. Uh, and uh, so, so tell us a little bit about part two, where, where you live matters. Okay, so aging in place is a hot button for everyone and people may be aging solo in place, not necessarily, uh, they're, they're, they're not desiring that lifestyle, however, that is what it is. I have been in the caregiving, like I said, since 1985 to now, and eventually aging in place alone does not work. It just doesn't, and here's why. If you're home alone, there is a shelf life for being able to manage the people who come and go. And then if forgetfulness sets in, the quality of our decisions may uh, not be as good as we think they are. So the scammers might start rolling in. Then we all know there's a caregiver shortage, not to mention the house has fallen apart and, um, and so on. Aging in place is very doable if there are other people involved as advocates or as roommates or people who are committed to you. 
And this is really important because all of us keep seeing the universal design element of aging in place. That's like a no brainer. Put a grab bar in, put your, put your bedroom on the first floor. You're not good to go. That, that's just design. That is not social, intellectual, spiritual, and otherwise financial. That's right. Very good. I, I I love it. And and again, you're hitting all the the hot buttons for mm -hmm. our um our audience. The uh, and Ann Johnson says, Joy, you're spot on. And um the um there's been a few questions asking, like Robert says, are there solo aging consultants that um can help uh people with regard to community living arrangements or to have a healthcare ad advocate. And then there's other other folks, if, if everybody looks at chat, you'll see where there, there are so many different groups like the villages and, th and, and groups like that that can support you, whether you're aging in place or you're feeling like you need to build a circle or what have you. But have you, uh, either of you sort of stumbled into quote unquote consultants that can help through these types of challenges? Um, Carol? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I was responding to someone's question. Okay, I will be happy to. Okay. Um, first of all, that's a great business idea. So whoever suggested that, I, I um, was, and I, I do say this in my book, what we need are consultants slash advocates and the businesses now tend to be for people who are who are patient advocates but that's not what i'm talking about there are aging life care professionals who will tell you how to get to a house or or, or bring in care and all that but but as solo agers who are healthy what we need are consultants to to help us with healthy healthy solo agers and how to find advocacy throughout the rest of our lives. And to me, that's a business. And yeah. I bet you there's plenty of professionals on this call who could who could see the benefit of turning this into, into a consultancy that has nothing to do with healthcare. And boy, yeah. I would sign up in a heartbeat. Um, there are um, the life, life uh, long-term care insurance people are edging on aligning themselves up with these kinds of services. So, so in the interim, I would talk to a long-term care insurance person who it can act very much like a consultant and, 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 then, and then try to fill in the gaps with people who would be a consultant for, let, let's say you, you have a plumbing problem and you're aging alone and you don't want the plumber to come into your house and you're by yourself. Well, that's a, okay, we'll get somebody over there right away. So you're not alone and this person won't scam you. Stuff yeah. like that. And, and I, that was kind of a, when I read that question, I knew the response of the audience. And, um, and we unanimously, when we said, are there consultants that help with solo aging, aging life care managers? And, you know, just like attorneys, just like other professions, different aging life care managers uh, have different personalities. They have different areas of specialty. But one thing amongst aging life care managers, they're a very well connected community. And so if you call one and, and with a certain question, and that's not their area of specialty, they're very well versed in cross referrals and connecting you to somebody that might help. But uh, what a what a profession and that would be uh that would be great but uh someone um, said in the chat room that aging doula which is also a new category that's coming up so we have the death doula we have the divorce doula we have the birth doula, doula and now we got the aging doula and i think that's so good so just I like that uh, yeah but just just remember um it's our responsibility to continuously say I am healthy. I have all my mental capacities. I just need someone to do X. As, as we age, we are going to have to help the people who are in the industry to define the kind of help we need. 
which is really cool. It's just the same as if we were going to a, a senior living community and we walk in the door and we, we give a tour of the place and we say, yeah, but, but this is what I need. Can you give me that? This is what I want. And, I like and so we're just going to be pushing the envelope and we should because it's our life. That's right. Let's um let we're gonna don't worry, folks, we're gonna get to all these questions, but let's get to part four, which is uh safety nets. And Joy, yeah. share some reflections on that part of your book. Uh, my favorite uh chapter in this one is the early onset Alzheimer's and the value of knowing. So there is going to be, as we know, uh an enormous, even bigger than ever we thought, uh population of people who have dementia not necessarily Alzheimer's, but a, a, enough dementia to be living in the community and um, trying to negotiate living under those circumstances, living with the, with the uh, symptoms of dementia. So I am very familiar, in fact, I'm working with communities now, Evansville is one of them, where we are talking about creating dementia-friendly communities. I think this is super important we are going to need to learn how to age together with people who have dementia and the more we help each other with forgetfulness the better off we will all be i see this as a community effort we got to get the leaders involved the mayors you name it so we've all heard of age friendly now we have to bring it forward to dementia friendly and especially dementia friendly in the workplace Absolutely. Yep, and uh, one of the first dementia-friendly communities is near where I am in um, uh, in the D.C. area. It's a great movement because if you can educate people in the community how to uh, respectively treat people who have dementia, you're you're creating an environment where people they're going to treat everybody better. It's kind of like universal design. Let's. Let's design our spaces so that people with the most challenging disabilities can function and it's better for everybody. Same, same thing. Um, so that's great. Let, let me, the, the comments are coming in fast and furious. Let's jump to the last part of your book, uh, part five, no tomorrow. And then we'll just, we'll just run through these questions until we're done. Okay. That's awesome. People think that, um, I just want to focus on hospice. Um, people think that hospice is a, a, a guaranteed high level of, of care. Unfortunately, that's not the case. We have to shop around. Um, the quality of the different hospice programs is um, night and day. Um, I've seen the worst of it, and I'm sure many of you have seen the best of it. What I would like to see, and again, this is another business that I've made up in my head that I wish would come to uh, reality, but why don't we have places um, where we can go and learn about death and dying and then actually as solo agers end up in these beautiful, peaceful, well-run places that are, that are exactly what we would want for ourselves. How are we going to do death and dying as solo agers? And so this, this is just weighs heavily on my mind. I, I see so many people who have it all written out and they, they have it on paper, <clears throat> but when it push comes to shove, sometimes it just doesn't happen. And in fact, many times it doesn't happen. So the quality of hospice varies and we need to do more homework. I wish people in the audience would take that on with a vengeance. There is a senior living community in Lincoln, Nebraska that has, it's, it's a uh, life plan community, but it has a separate building on the property. And I can't, I can't remember what it is called, but it is the place where people then get transitioned to that building and it is the most beautiful place I've ever been and would love to know that I could have that for myself in my in my last decade or my last days. Why don't we have more of those? Good yeah. point. And 
tons of awesome comments on all of these things that you've brought up, Joy, um, are in the um, are in the chat. Uh, th I, I like this format. What, how about you? Uh, huh. Yeah, I, 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 I thought it was a great. good way to go through your book and how robust yeah. it is. And Carol, we'll, we'll do the same for you with your new book. But but let's get back to some of these questions. And I want to go back to one of the first questions that came in because um, from Susan Evans, who says, I'm truly a solo ager, no kids, <laughs> no family. It is not sad. I live a happy life at age 69. What about appointing trustees? Can one person be a trustee for medical, financial, uh, for medical and financial? And uh, I, I want you guys to give feedback on this, but also Susan, I want to direct you to the link because we had so mo many legal and financial yeah. qu questions about solo aging. We did a whole talk on it and I'll make sure to uh, drop that in there for you. So we have to be careful about it, choosing individuals rather than a company, because then we get ourselves into, well, what if that person goes and uh, moves away or is unavailable? So um, I would refer to an attorney's office and see if they can recommend um, a business, more of a business model so that you, you can always uh, count on someone being there and your paperwork would be handed down. And um, we can't just do our paperwork and then let it go. We need to look at our paperwork every six months. Even if we have named someone to be <clears throat> our power of attorney for um, health and finances, we need to take a look at that because perhaps dementia will have set in or they moved away and so on. So be aware that uh, we have to be uh, very careful about that and uh, just kind of babysit our paperwork every six yep. months. And, and another resource that I would like to recommend is the American Bar Association. Mm -hmm. If you go to their website, they have some incredible uh, eBooks uh, or guides, I should say, on how to select healthcare proxies, financial proxies. And they give a wealth of information there at American Bar Association. And I, I guess that's uh, ambar.org. Uh, Steve, maybe, I don't know if you have that available, but um, nonetheless, you can just Google it, American Bar Association. And then under the menu, look for uh, senior information or aging information, I think is what it's under. I got it. I'll drop that into chat. Oh, good. Um, Let's see, Nancy from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania says, and this is another good one. Many of us cannot afford consulting services or an aging life care manager. I just turned 70. I'm still employed as a social worker and I live in a senior's low income high rise. I'm not sure that I personally would be able to afford this type of service, but it's an excellent concept. And um, I, I'd love your thoughts on that, Joy. We talk about affordability an awful yep. lot in our discussions. I wrote this book with the, with the with the people like me and everyone who just needs to be aware that money is is the expense of aging is astronomical, right? And so we um, I was reading too many books before that were saying, oh, just go get a lawyer, just go get a financial planner. Well, that's not always possible. And like you said, so we begin the process of looking for local resources that are on a volunteer basis. I would start with the um, aging uh, departments of each city. There are people who give legal advice financial advice pro bono and uh, going to the uh, area agencies on aging and finding out where all of those volunteers are. Um, they're also online. And just the important thing is, is to begin to talk with them. I, I hear you loud and clear. I know that financing a longer life is gonna be a struggle for all of us. It's just amazing. I, I live in Chicago and I live in the part of the city where next door is one of the poorest neighborhoods. It was called Caprini Green. 
but those people who lived in Caprini Green, and I go to church with them, they live a very, very high quality of life because they have done their homework and they have looked at the resources that Chicago has to offer. And they go to, they go to the opera for free, they get free taxi cabs, they get free food, they get, they get free medical services because they've ventured out and they've done their homework and research on what is available for people of lower incomes. Also, um, the elder care locator is another resource for you, which is a national uh, organization. Yeah. So just, just type in elder care locator in your browser and boom, so many resources. Yeah. There's even free dental. So please just, just don't, you know, don't let, let's not let our pride get in front of uh, asking for financial assistance because it's real. Mm -hmm. And I also suggest going to your local senior centers and local yep. public libraries, and they can help yeah. you do research as well. And if they should be, you know, but they are a community resource for all residents in that particular city, wherever you live. So you could even uh, help, uh, not necessarily work with them, but you could help promote or help them or encourage them to create or help you find resources, the, the local resources that can help you take care of some of these issues. Mm -hmm. um, great, uh, um, let's can see. Can I just say one thing? Sure. In my book under the, um, the financial chapter, which is, the, um, which is in the first one, personal readiness, there is a suggestion that you go to your browser and you type in the word free and your city. Right after that, you'll be surprised what pops up. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's crazy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, Carol, feel free to jump in if any of the chat uh, Sorry, uh, jumps out at you. That's okay. Yes. I've been looking as well. Um, Jenna Jones says, um, and again, so some of these are are solo aging specific discussions, but but they're we're all potential solo agers Absolutely. and uh and she she says any suggestions for the process of relocating to a more affordable place to live i know i can't afford to continue living and retiring in the dmv um it, you know one of the things uh jenna to um uh and, and and then she follows up it's sad to think of starting over by myself somewhere else and that's what i was going to comment on is is that you have built a network and friendship and familiarity with the area that you live in and so the first order of business is to try to tap into resources and getting creative to live within your budget and joy you alluded to it a little bit home sharing is a growing trend that minimizes isolation and can save money. Yeah, um, I would do everything I could to stay in the network and in the neighborhood before I would move, which will be 10 times worse. Um, and and I just uh, get, get some ideas regarding um, how to make your lifestyle more affordable before you move. Moving is horrible. We all know it that. Is. Yes. And and you know what we were talking about this in um, in one of my book clubs. I I do book clubs where we we go through my book and um, and uh, at the end of the book club we go okay where is everybody right now? And so everybody typically says well we've got to do something about our community. It's not up to speed. And so this is one of those areas. And and don't go don't do this one alone. Gather some people who have the potential to to also have the same concerns you do, get together, form a little community and figure out how to create an affordable aging community before anything else. And uh, you never know, maybe some of the things you think about haven't even been created yet, you know, just right. there, there's so much creativity in this process when you do it early enough. Yeah, and Steve, yeah. I want to mention to, uh, so that everyone knows that you will download the chat. 
because there Absolutely. are so many resources here that we cannot miss out on all yeah. these resources. Oh, this is, um, this is awesome. And um, I oh. also want to suggest to everyone and Steve, maybe you can make a comment about it. I mean, we have a really great community going on here in the chat. And if we could somehow build off of this, well, you know, we can help each other out. So one one really cool thing in the beginning, I, I shared with you that we're going to be doing this dementia uh, or memory right. care resource fair. The other platform we use enables us to kind of sit at tables and talk to each other. And so maybe, Carol, we can experiment on our when we talk about your book. Um, maybe we can schedule that next month and try to use the Remo platform and have kind of table conversations. That'd be um, great. Now, uh, I noticed there's a bunch of people that raised their hand. We've got N Marks, we've got Jason, and we've got Mary. I'm opening up your microphones um, if, if to the three of those. If you'd like to make a comment, um, your your mics are open. If it was just by mistake, no worries. But if you if if you I prompted you to open your mic if you'd like to um, uh, share something. And then um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, let's see here. I'm, I'm scanning here um, to see if there's a, an interesting. Um, uh, uh, oh, well, I got to read this one. It's from Sharon. And she says, Joy, I have your book. And I love how many resources you have to share. I've bookmarked all of them. So that's, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, the um, uh, okay. Um, now, okay, here's a yeah. Comment. Do you mind if I mention this? I and mean, this one's from Bonnie Silverman. Now, Bonnie, I think this is very interesting. You're asking a question Does anyone know of or live in a high rise apartment condominium that has formed a caregiving group? And you'd love to hear about this. Uh, I can I, answer that. Oh, perfect. Do you, live in a, do you live in a high rise, Carol? I didn't mean to cut I you do. off. I do. Yes. Okay, yeah. So you first. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll interject. Oh, Bonnie wants to speak. I would love to hear that. Oh yeah. Here let's, um, yeah. okay. Bonnie, I, I opened up your mic. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, great. Um, well, I've been interested in aging even before I started to feel I was aging. <laughs> Uh, because I'm, a, uh, I've been in the insurance business for over 30 years, and at one time I, I specialized solely in a long-term care insurance, and then I broadened it, narrowed it, kind of depending on the interest level at a given time. Um, and I've gone through uh, dementia with uh, my mother and been. Uh, not her direct caregiver, but her advocate and being there, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for her in many, many ways for uh, 10 years. And some of it was long distance when she was in Florida. Okay, so I do live in a large uh, condominium in the center of Philadelphia. Uh, we have hospitals, we have two major teaching hospitals. Um, so we, we have a lot of medical care available. Uh, Jane Ailey, I know, is, is on the call and she's the director of uh, Penn's Village and they provide uh, resources. But I'm thinking that um, the community that I live in, uh, we have probably, I don't know, six or eight, 600 or more units, is somewhat divided between the, the over 60s and then the younger people who have no interest in, in coming to holiday parties. I mean, they basically don't, you know, don't show up for too much. Um, is so, but, but the, the older community would be a more interested community in possibly forming some kind of network. And I don't know what, I mean, this is all kind of bubbling around. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the background. Mm -hmm. And just wondering what, um, uh, 
Joy and Carol, I think you both said that you live in, in high rise communities. I, so yeah, I do. And, and Joy, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go ahead Please. and at least t tell you my story, Bonnie. I've been in this high rise for five years and it, it's it all came out of my own planning to put myself in a, in a place where I have neighbors and friends right outside my door because I was living in the suburbs and I felt terribly isolated and alone. And thank goodness I moved to, you know, especially during the pandemic because I was never alone. So it, it took us some time. However, when I first arrived, we created through another resident who was very, very friendly. She's a realtor, so that helps. <laughs> anyway, she and I created a social a social club, basically. And we started meeting uh, once a month. And, uh, and people, we either did, you know, happy hours, or we did just games or what have you. But for out of that experience, we have, you know, built and created some really close relationships. And uh, so my experience is don't give up. And, uh, and constantly reach out to people, be friendly, just talk about some of the ideas you have and, and just form relationships and never give up. And because I, it took me two years for people to become friendly with me. Uh, you know, I'm talking about residents that have, been, that have lived here for a long time. And at first I thought, well, why isn't any, you know, why aren't people more open? Well, it doesn't matter. After two years now, we're all just so friendly with each other, which is really wonderful. Um, so just give it time. Start, you know, just start uh, talking about some of the ideas and start talking with residents in the hallways, downstairs, wherever you are. We have a coffee room downstairs. So that helps us, you know, have a place where we can meet socially. Um, so I'm not sure what your building might look like, but I just want to encourage you to continue to reach out with, for, with residents, with neighbors, and, and just be as friendly as you can and don't give up. And, and um, uh, Thank you. before you jump off, Bonnie, um, somebody wanted to know the name of the community in Philadelphia that you referenced. Oh, where I live? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I live in the Hopkinson house. Okay, great. It's in Society Hill on Washington Square, um, right across the street from a park. I walk into the park. Uh, I, I usually see at least a half a dozen neighbors. So the um, uh, you've, you're, we're going to go down a rabbit hole here that we could devote a whole hour to, but I'm going to bring it up anyways, because I think, Joy, you and I were talking about this, the, va the value of living in an urban uh, environment as you grow older, if you you don't need a car, you're mm -hmm. amongst people of all ages, the challenge, or there's lots of challenges to everything, but if you've grown up in the white picket fence, car dependent tree line suburbs, it might be intimidating to go to an urban environment, but Joy, I think you've got some I, some thoughts and ideas on that. And thank you, Bonnie. I'm going to. Yeah, mute and you. I just want to say that I've been living here for 33 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I am a friendly person, but I do find that people have still have their own kind of little groups and not necessarily, um, it, it isn't necessarily as social as one would think. Um, even though people know my name and we say hello, and then kind of people go off in different directions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes Bonnie, uh, during the holidays or during special events, if you volunteer on some of the uh, things that they need, uh, even if they need help, I, I'm finding that uh, that is a good way to just be with like minded people who like to volunteer it it takes time like carol said so what happens is is it isn't just hey you want to have dinner it's really just trying to get in with some of the activities that get on the activity committee of something and begin the process there yeah. um, that's the only way in a high rise because you have people that won't even look at you in the elevator and and then there's other people who just like they won't shut up so yeah. so so you'll um but i have found that getting on the committees is the best place to start yeah i 
I run the, the I run the Hanukkah uh, party the last few years, which of course we haven't had. So hopefully go. this year. And also yeah. there's the pool. And but I think um, I think your suggestion about talking to people about this idea, which I just got, you know, while we're on this great conversation about uh, kind of not necessarily formalizing, but maybe working toward a mm -hmm. kind of a soft kind of a group, you know, right. that people can kind of come and go uh, mm -hmm. as they please, but to, to know that there are people that will be there for them, mm -hmm. even though they may not be close friends, they just know each other just by sight um, and just kind of enlarging the circle. So I think that's great. One of the things that I did is I slipped, uh, if I saw somebody coming in and out of the apartment on my floor, I only on my floor, I would go up to them and say, hey, I just want you to know I live at the corner. My name's Joy and blah, blah, blah. So at least I know the people on my floor. Good. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. Thanks. Yeah. Great to hear from you. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks, Bonnie. Wow. Um, I just looked at the clock. It's past yeah. one o'clock. I, I, I think we got through most of the formal questions. Chat's blowing up. So I, uh, <laughs> really it's hard for me to even <laughs> go through and, 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 and look at those. Um, we need the, a get together. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, but, but this is, but once again, I mean, we've, we, I'm just so grateful to have stumbled into this topic because it's so interesting and engaging and positive and um, and it brings together like minded people. I mean, it's like I hope everybody in the audience and, and the two of you feel the positive energy that I'm feeling. I feel yeah. like these conversations make a difference in all of our futures. And so I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, I'm going to I'm going to upload this recording immediately. Okay. I'll also make sure that I upload it as, as a podcast so you can share it easily share it with people and they can walk their dog and listen to it. And the um, um, and then uh, Carol, let's let's get you scheduled next month. And Joy, I hope you come back when we try to do this discussion with the um, in the Remo format. I think it would be a really great way to talk about um, solo aging. Uh, just so uh, somebody just said, how do we download the the chat? And it's, um, don't worry about that. It's gonna okay. be on the recording link that I'm gonna be posting at Pro Aging this okay. afternoon. Great. And, uh, and oh, one other little controversial thing in chat that really goes to show how much we've expanded. Several of us have said DMV on this discussion. DMV stands for DC, Maryland, and Virginia, not Division of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> the, the origin of this group was based in the DMV, and we sort of throw it around, but we got to stop using that because now we've got this global audience. Um, so uh, anyways, that's a fun, a, a fun little Thing that we've got to learn now that our 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 wings have expanded so much, uh, Joy. This you are absolutely amazing. I <laughs> I am still kind of stuck back in how what the critical thinking and how you mm -hmm. describe that and how important that is when thinking about anything aging related is mm -hmm. to just talk to people. Don't be afraid to to expand your field of vision and. And in the t in in doing that, you're going to make friends. You're going to make new That's friends. True. You're going to make connections. Absolutely. Yeah, and and the the cultural aspect of that, right? So other cultures don't have the problems Americans do. I I have an Italian citizenship, and I am I have um, a, a whole different way of doing living and aging because of my my Italian ancestry. So so it's like you never know what you're going to learn. Uh, just just talk to people you would never talk to and yeah. you will have a wealth of information. And a, and like Steve said, maybe new friends. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Carol, congrats on the new book, Solo and Smart. I'm, I'm putting that link in uh, as well. And uh, 
I I look forward to this is just the beginning where you're folks, you're going to see these two folks uh, a lot here through our platform because they're wonderful. And this is a, a very important topic. So mm -hmm. I can't wait till the next discussion. Thanks, uh, Carol. And thanks, Joy, for uh, such an engaging discussion. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you, Steve. Thank and you. And thanks all for to the us. audience. You thank guys you, are what make these discussions. I mean, <laughs> yeah. what what amazing questions and, and comments. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Uh, can, can I, uh, people may be exiting, but I just wanted to make one quick remark. Uh, sure. when, when Bonnie and Joy, when you were talking, uh, I was going to say when Joy said, especially on your own floor in a high rise or an apartment building or wherever, get to know your neighbors. Uh, and this was not my idea. This is one of my neighbors who I just she, she is just a, a, a delight and she's a solo person. Anyway, what she does, and she's really encouraged uh, all of our neighbors to have like a really small open house, you know, in our own apartments, just come over, have a cup of coffee, glass of wine, what have you. I mean, not to stay real long, but just to come in and introduce yourself and get to know each other just for a few, few minutes. And that way you, you start building relationships yep. just like that. And you know, I, I, the ideas like that, a lot of times I'll be in a conversation where somebody will throw out an idea like that and, and they'll, they'll inevitably be somebody in that circle that says, oh, that's not for me. I wouldn't <laughs> open my doors. I wouldn't okay. go to anything like that. It's okay. That's the beauty of it is, is <laughs> yeah. that it, the people that are gonna come are gonna be the people that you can connect with in there. It's a self-selecting, type thing but it but it takes a person to extend the olive branch to make that connection and uh so great suggestion i, I really want to get this urban retirement uh um discussion going so we'll uh we'll start building a panel on that one. Oh, sounds okay. great doesn't it see everybody at the next one <laughs>